Okay. Clustering. So what I'm going to be talking about is principles of clustering, um, especially hierarchical clustering, um, a little bit about k-means and model-based clustering as alternatives, and I'm also going to be talking about density estimation as an alternative to clustering, depending on the question that you want to learn. So what I'd like to take for you to take out of this lecture is that you understand some of the foundations of clustering, concepts of similarity and matricity of the data. That you also understand that there's no such thing as the best method for clustering, but it's a problem of trade-offs that you have to solve here. Learn a little bit about the functions that are available to cluster data in R. And I'd really like you to be able to become at least somewhat competent in constructing your own data sets. I'm not a fan of downloading data sets and operating on them because then the data really is just a black box. What I'm a huge fan of is simulating your data under known parameters and seeing if you can retrieve your known parameters with the model that you're applying. Because if you can't, then how do you want to retrieve meaningful parameters from data that you've downloaded elsewhere? So this is, I think this is really important, becoming competent in using R to play with it, to construct synthetic data, and to try things out in various ways, and easily being able to change you know, variance on your models or number of, of data points or data parameters, and then see what they do. Okay, here's the fundamental type of problem that we're going to be looking at. I'm using an, an analog pointer. It's not to intimidate you guys. But it's very useful to it's very useful to the little blade that you showed me. No, no, it's not Dan Hooper. Um Okay, so what's this? Two variables. One is plotted along the x-axis and one is plotted along the y-axis. And we have a scatter plot of these data, and every one of these data points represents two numbers, the number on the x and the number on the y-axis. And the typical question of cluster analysis is to ask, are there data points here that are different from other data points in a systematic way. So for instance, are there data points here that would be drawn from a very different distribution than others, or that have their values because of some different underlying properties? Are we actually looking at a homogeneous data set here, or are the samples that we're looking at drawn from two significantly different populations? Can we identify the population? Can we learn something about the populations once we identify them? And this problem comes up in a, in a large number of interesting questions. Um, the kind of work we do with clustering is to say, can we find groups on data like that um, that we can work with? Can we partition all the points into separate classes? And can we then assign perhaps also new data to fall into any of these classes? can we make inferences about whether um, a data point is a member or a non-member of a particular cluster. This can come up in, in hugely disparate domains. Uh, examples are, some are uh, for instance, uh, complexes and in interaction data. So what's interaction data? What? Interaction data, protein protein interactions. Physical interaction between proteins, for example, is one type of interaction. Okay, physical interactions would be one type of interactions. 
but what is interaction data? How would interaction data look like? You're not, you're not unlikely to come across interaction data, especially when you try to do functional annotation. Correlate? Co-regulate? Well, that's a different type of interaction data. A network. A net yes. Network. Graph. Francis. So it's usually an Excel spreadsheet with two columns, and column A and column B, and A binds to B into some parameter. Exactly. There would be two columns, but the significance is in the column as well as in the row, because if you have a gene or a protein in column one and the gene and the protein in column two in the same row. This is the way that you're coding that they actually do interact in some way that your experiment has suggested. So you can draw a graph where you take all of the interacting genes and connect them by a line. And then you can ask, what does this tell me? Now, if we listen to the funding agencies and to the people who write grant proposals, uh, to funding agencies, this will tell you, you know, how life works. Because after all, we have a comprehensive list of genes, and now we're trying to figure out what they do, and what they do is they interact with something and do something, and once we've established all the interactions, we piece together the puzzles and see how everything works together, and we can reconstruct life from first principle from our Excel spreadsheets. The problem is there's a lot of noise, and, and um, a lot of interactions are also missed. And if you do interaction analysis with different methods, like these two hybrid methods, or mass spectrometry methods, and, and affinity tag tag methods, you get different genes in different rows of your data sets. And they don't always coincide. But one of the typical questions that we, we're interested in for physical interactions is, is there complexes? Do proteins stably interact together? And thus, do their functions add together the elementary functions to do something you know, that's more than simply the sum of their parts? And in order to do that, there's a hypothesis that says if a number of genes are in a complex, I should be able to observe interactions between all of them. So if A, B, C, D are in a complex, A should be interacting with B and with C, as well as with D. And D should be interacting with B and C, and C should also be interacting with D. So all of them should be connected. And the way we can pull this out of the raw interaction <coughs> network is to cluster graphs, to see are there nodes of points, are, are, are there clouds of points that somehow belong together because they're highly densely connected, much more connected among themselves than they are connected to other things that are outside. Which, by the way, is one of the crucial notions of cluster analysis. Things within the cluster make more interactions with each other than with things outside of the cluster, whatever these interactions are. Different question. Does a protein structure have um, domains? What is a protein? Well, if we look at a protein structure, essentially it's a cloud of three-dimensional vectors. In terms of statistics, it's data. You have rows, and you have three columns, and the rows correspond to the atoms, and the columns correspond to the x, y, and z coordinates. And you can analyze that statistically. For instance, you can look at whether some of these points lie very closely together in a systematic fashion. There might be a cloud of points which is very close together and a cloud of points which is more distant. So by looking at interactions between these with methods that usually imply a bit more background knowledge about what a protein is and, and which types of uh, amino acids interact with each other and so on, you can start defining whether the protein can be usefully subdivided into, into subdivisions. Or you can start clustering proteins of similar function um, based on measured similar properties, i.e., for instance, co-regulation. What's the hypothesis with co-regulation? Why are we looking at co-regulation? Well, for example, 
about the metabolic pathway, that you need two genes or three genes at the same time to conduct that specific process, so they need to be co-regulated. Exactly. So if gene activity has to be modulated in response to some challenge, or in response to the cell cycle or whatever, and the gene activity is regulated in the way that the expression is switched on or switched off, if a number of genes have to be cooperating at the same time to perform a particular task, then their expression should be co-regulated in the sense that they all should be expressed at the same time and then lost again um, after that with some decay constant. So that's a hypothesis. This is sometimes true and it is sometimes not true. It's a hypothesis to guide us along in our um, discovery science or fishing expeditions, whatever you want to call it, that if you find genes that seem to be co-regulated, there's, there's this idea behind it that they perform a similar function or they're all part of a functional system within the cell. And uh, if among that group of co-regulated genes, there might be one whose function is unknown, the function of the other genes might be a good working hypothesis as to what that unknown gene is actually doing. Now, <clears throat> in order to be able to apply any kind of method to any kind of experiment, reasonably, and that of course includes statistical methods, statistical experiments to data, you have to be comfortable with thinking about your data, understanding what your data is and what it does. And this is my little teamwork task for this morning. I would like you to look at your neighbor, or if there are three people in a bench, to stick your heads together in a small group of three for two or three minutes, and among you, come up with one example of where you could expect to usefully apply cluster analysis. And that would be an example where data points of any type are somehow measured through the similar method and end up in the same data set, but the underlying measurements are taken from different <coughs> distributions, or there's something within that that pulls them apart. Co-regulation would be one example that, that I've mentioned. And when you do that, think about in a typical setting, how many samples would you be looking at in your cluster? Would it be 100 or 100,000? How many dimensions does your measurement provide? Is it just something that you cluster in an x and y axis? Or does every data point actually correspond to 200 or 300 discrete measurements and in an expression profile, would they all be commensurate or would there be categorical variables involved like male, female, diseased, free of disease, um, chemical concentration, age of patient, and so on. What are the elements, what are the properties that you're trying to compare? What could the variation in the dimensions look like? You know, if, if we're looking at age, the variation could be from 0 to 100. If we're looking at gender, the variation is typically only between three, male, female, and undisclosed. And then what is the metric of similarity that you would apply? And that's really interesting because clustering ultimately operates on measurements between data points, the definition of whether two points are similar or dissimilar, and you need to apply a metric. In the example that I've shown you before, this here, basically the only metric we have, since this is x and y axis, is to measure the distances in the distribution, <coughs> and a Euclidean metric, or a geometric metric. But of course, you can think creatively about metrics to apply. You know, time along the cell cycle would be a metric between data 
And ultimately, what's the question? And that, that actually is the most important point here. What is the question that you would like to ask? What's the information that you would like to have? In most cases, the, information, the question looks something like, well, my data points are drawn from two different classes. Can I identify properties of these classes from um, my set? Now, I'd like you to think about that basically as an exercise here, and we'll go through maybe two or three results. Um, because that's what you really have to do at home. If you want to analyze any of your data and you want to try to come to grips with the data and truly understand what the data is that you're looking at, you have to go to your data sets and answer these kinds of questions before you even start firing up your computer and using R. It's a tool that you can apply best when you know what you're applying it to, and this is part of your data. So stick your heads together, two or three people, um, two or three minutes. If you're completely stuck and don't know what you're supposed to do, raise your hand <laughs> and ask Francis because he was just kidding. Me. It's actually useful if you if you make notes with this and record what you've thought and come up with. My stick? <laughs> so let's take as a note all people in this class. Yes. And the first, uh, it's a sample. So how many dimensions? I don't know. It's a lot. We'll, we'll count. How many? What are the elements? For example, if we know each other, it's one. If we don't know each other, it's zero. So okay. it's binary. And uh, if we are from one city or one university or not, 
then uh, the, the, the age. Mm -hmm. Then uh, whether they are postdocs, PhD students, uh, PIs, uh, and so on. Institutional hierarchies, yes. Yes, institutional hierarchies. Then... Uh, Fancy word. It's good for grant applications. It's a lot. And um, what is their property? So it's clear, it's either 1, 0, either age is from 0, not from 0, <laughs> but are there properties that you haven't encoded in your data and that you're interested in? Uh, you mean the hypothesis? Yes. The hypothesis will be, for example, uh, uh, after we have clustered them, mm -hmm. whether people with blue eyes uh, in the cluster and black eyes outside of the cluster. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, the metric metric of similarity could be a relation in a coefficient like age, it could be sperman, mm -hmm. like uh, if they have the same group of age, uh, so they are closer to each other. Yeah. Uh, if it's the uh, uh, same city, I don't know, it could be a premium distance. Mm -hmm. For that dimension? Yeah. I, I think in, in that description, you, you immediately see a problem. You have data that is categorical, you have data that is um, yep. that, that is numerical, it can be discrete, it can be continuous, and so on. And ultimately, you're asking about one distance between two points, and it all has to come together. So here's the first problem there, that somehow this has to be weighted, and it's not obvious that um, the, da the raw data, as we get it, will allow such weighting. And it's not obvious because, you know, if you're comparing a very large variable with a very small variable, the small variable is not going to contribute to the distance if you all treat them in the same. Hmm? With from these, from these examples, what are the dimensions and what are the, are the elements? I didn't get it. So, oh, so the elements are the people in okay. this class. And the dimensions are the different properties of each person in the class okay. along which you want to establish their similarity or dissimilarity. Okay. And the question you would like to ask is, were well, the blue-eyed people are more likely to be post blocks from the same city that <laughs> actually talk to each other than <coughs> black-eyed? Yeah, this is one question that, that, that we could ask. However, very often, the questions that we want to ask are not actually encoded anywhere in the data. So whether somebody is blue-eyed or black-eyed and what their properties are, um, and whether these properties inform a certain amount of covariance can also somehow be solved in nicely with other methods. So if you look at blue-eyed, it's, it's more like a regression. You know, just is blue-eyed a good predictor for other variables? Clustering would like to ask something that's not in the data, that you can't measure, but that you would like to infer from the properties of the data set. Anything else? Any volunteers? We have volunteers? Somebody's twitching here? Yes? You want to talk about what you came up with? No? Nobody else. <coughs> Process, you have to get stronger, probably. Uh, yeah. Yeah, or beer. Sorry. Or beer. A couple of beers oh, in the yeah. morning will really get the juices flowing. Okay. So. <coughs> As I've alluded to, clustering is the classification of similar objects into different groups. It's a problem to partition a data set into subsets, which we call cluster, so that the data in each subset are close to one another, and closeness is measured through some manner. I think that, that intuitively makes a lot of sense. Um, you have to be aware of what partitioning means, though. What does partitioning mean? Divide. Divide. In a sense, you divide the data set. 
There's an important point here. All the data points get assigned. You completely divide the data set. If you have two clusters, all the data points are either in one cluster or another cluster. That's what a partitioning is. And I'm mentioning that specifically because that's not always the most reasonable way to look at your data. Some of the data in your data set might simply be noise. And there's no point in putting noise to good clusters or to good data and make, taking inferences from that. We'll come to that much, much later in this lecture. OK, one of the fundamental approaches here is hierarchical clustering. Given n items and a distance metric, first, assign each item to a cluster. Initialize the distance matrix between clusters as the distance between items. Find the closest pair of clusters and merge them into a single cluster and compute new distances between clusters. So initially, each item represents one cluster. If your data set has 100 items, then you start out with 100 clusters. And then you look for the closest ones and then you merge them through some distance metric. And then you recompute between the merged clusters. And then you start comparing the properties of similarity within the clusters and similarity between the clusters. And you repeat that iteratively until all items are finally classified into a single cluster. Whoa, we could have done that right away, couldn't we? We could have just said, well, it's all one single cluster, right? So why is this useful? We end up with everything in one single cluster. What's the point? Can you imagine? Because you get the whole tree as well. You get that whole tree as well. What tree? Yeah. The tree of how it was combined at each stage. How it was combined together at each stage, right? You get a tree from that. That basically, <coughs> the tree is a, is a recording of the merging steps that you've done. The dendrogram or tree of hierarchical clustering, which you'll see in moment it is a recording of the sequence of steps that you have undertaken until you finally arrived at a single cluster. The question then, of course, is how do we interpret this tree in the sense of um, doing something useful with it? Okay, so there's a, there's a catch in this, and it's in this sentence, given n items and a distance metric. Because the question is, what is a metric? So mathematically speaking, a metric has very definite properties. A metric is a number. Uh, it's, sorry, it's, 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 it's a function d on some vector x. And uh, Michelle doesn't have the same function. And the metric has to fulfill three conditions. A distance between two points x and y is zero if and only if x equals y. So if you have two observations and they are the same, and they become indis they are indistinguishable, two observations of the same element gives you a zero distance. And if you have two a zero distance, this means that two elements are the same. If two elements are different, under a distance metric, they can't have zero distance. And that's important. Think of, think of a graph, um, a network of things. If, think of a subway network. If all of a sudden you would have one subway station coincide with another subway station without any distance in between them, that could not be embodied in any kind of physical reality. So there is no such thing as zero distance between disparate elements. Now, if your data is structured such that at times you have zero distance between disparate elements that you would otherwise like to distinguish, clustering is not something that you can apply to that data set because it's not metric. Secondly, symmetry. That's a very important property. 
Symmetry basically mathematically is described. The distance between points x and y is the exact same as the distance between points y and x, which in many real world situations isn't actually the case. The distance of me going to work in the morning always seems a lot further than me coming back from work in the evening. It seems a lot closer. on the distance metric, right? If the distance metric is in kilometers on the map, it's the same distance. If the distance metric is my impression of it, it's a different distance. So I don't anymore have something that I can cluster in this sense because my distance is not symmetric. It becomes dependent in which order I look at my data, what ultimately is the distance between points. And, you know, we always show clustering in these simplified examples of point clouds on two-dimensional maps. That's you know, one of the weakest things that you can do. There are much more interesting metrics, usually, that you can apply to your data that include all kinds of categorical variables, not just Euclidean distances. So in that case, symmetry would be violated, not a metric. Clustering applications will fail. Most importantly, um, there's an equal sign missing. I think it should be in the slide there. Now the distance between points x and y is less or equal in the PDF slides. The distance between the points x and y should be less or equal than the distance between x and z and z and y. This is a triangle inequality. What I'm encoding mathematically here is that if you're going from one point to another point, this is the shortest possible distance. And if you take a detour via point Z, it can't be any shorter. And in order to apply clustering methods uh, to data sets, you really have to think deeply whether this one is actually fulfilled. Definitely not all biological measurements fulfill this criterion. There's, there's instances of graphs that very easily violate this. It just depends on how this is coded. But it's possible that the detour gives a shorter distance. Right? If, if, I, if I put points on a graph, I'm, I'm completely free to weight the distances between them. God, Francis, you need to get a wireless microphone. I feel like a dog going for a walk in the morning. <laughs> okay, so we're here. We have three points here, which we have determined under some experimental conditions. And there's a distance between these two points, which is 10. And there's a distance between these two points, which is 2. And a distance between these two points, which is also 2. You know, just some experimental values, which we've observed. And you can imagine that, you know, comparing two genes or two proteins, you could have some kind of measurements that gives this kind of result. Well, the problem is this is no longer metric because all of a sudden, if I go from here to here, my distance is 10. But if I take the detour from here to here and then from here to here, my distance is only 4. So this kind of detour possibilities will mess up all cluster analysis because all of a sudden, um, whether something is close to something else, like this one to this one, and that one is close to something else again, is no longer informative on whether these two points are close or distant, or what happens. So cluster, of course you can cluster something like that, but the cluster results are no longer inter interpretable. So it's like, you know, distant neighbors can seem randomly close or distant, no matter what their relationship within the cluster is. This is often glossed over, and most people simply use some kind of Euclidean metric Oh, what's, what's a Euclidean metric? We're using this term a lot 
So since you're not asking, I assume that everybody knows what it is. No. So if I'm using terms that you're not familiar with, and you don't ask, that's not good. Um, Euclidean metric or Cartesian spaces basically are metric that assume orthogonal coordinate systems for different dimensions. Orthogonal coordinate systems means coordinate systems where the coordinate uh, axes are at right angles to each other. And we have values. See, you can't do that with a laser pointer. That's a shame. <laughs> and you have points in these, and the distance between these points can simply be calculated by the application of Pythagoras' theorem. Like the distance between A and B is the square root of the square of, of the distance on each of their dimensions. And you can generalize that to higher dimensions. And that's a Euclidean metric. So anything that can be embedded on a 2D plot or into a 3D space or a 4D hyperspace and so on, which can be you know, nicely embedded and where that embedding defines the distance between that points can be analyzed under this Euclidean metric. And if that's the case, these spaces are metric, so you don't need to worry about it. But you know, very often, especially when you include categorical data and different weighting of that, um, it's not obvious anymore whether these properties are fulfilled. Yes? Some kind of um, well, you think of think of an influence on biochemical reactions here. You know, if you put A and B together, you have some kind of um, an acceleration or deceleration of a rate constant, and that might have some acceleration and deceleration of a rate constant, and that might too. But there's no real reason why they should be in any way related because they might go through different interaction sites of the photon. So so it is it is it is certainly possible. The question is in the way you read it. What? Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Right. As I said, whenever you have Euclidean distance and you can map something into Cartesian rectangular spaces, you're fine. It's going to be metric. But if you're not, and that's often where interesting um, discriminatory analysis can come in, um, then uh, you have to be sure that, that you're actually looking at a metric. OK. Single linkage clustering. This is one of the metrics that can be applied to hierarchical clustering. Um, the distance between clusters is defined as the shortest distance from any member of one cluster to any member of the other cluster. This is single linkage. Um, we have this cluster here and that cluster here. And the metric is the distance between the closest point between the two clusters. Right? So under single linkage, if, we, if you have a third cluster here, and that also has points, the distance between cluster here and this cluster 2 would be calculated from different elements. It would be this one to something here and this one to something here. Already it takes a little thinking of whether that still is metric or whether it's possible to actually violate um, the triangle inequality with this. In complete linkage, you do something similar except the other way around and you cluster between the greatest distance from any member of one cluster to any, any member. And in average linkage, you take the average of all distances that basically describes the clustering. So it's different ways of, of defining these things here. So in an example, I'm going to look at the cell cycle data set. And I think you've already loaded that. So this is, this is, um, basically the only time that, that I'm using one of the example data sets. Um, are you all aware of what that data set is? What the columns are? What the rows are? Uh, you, you probably loaded that yesterday. If you don't, 
Um, expression levels of about 6,000 genes during the cell cycle, 17 time points, and so on. Um, <coughs> you can either load it from where it was <coughs> with whatever the path and the fighting was. Or, as pointed out in, in the slides here, You can do something very cool and very simple uh, with R. I actually got that data set uh, just by Googling for the file name. Found it somewhere um, in, at the University of Washington. And you can enter a URL that contains the data set as your complete path into R. And R will then automatically download that via the internet and make that data available. So you don't need to store your data on your own computer. You can download it basically on the fly within an R script from uh, the internet. So <coughs> the other commands that we're going to go through are all on this page here, which probably you'd like to have opened um, because you can then copy and paste into your window See, this is quick. Less than a second, and the data is here. So just to let me see that it's really here, how can I get the first few elements from that data set? Okay. So basically, let's look at the first row of that data set. What do I need to type? Uh, square. square bracket? One. One? Comma? comma. Nothing. What? Nothing? nothing? Why nothing? Doesn't that look incomplete? Is no. Because? If it's incomplete, if there's something missing here, R substitutes everything that it has for that. So in the real Cho data set, um, all of these genes are also labeled by name. Um, we've just selected um, that we're taking um, only the first 50 rows and only columns 3 to 19 from the entire data set to make it a little smaller, because the, the data set itself, of course, has 6,000 genes. OK. Right. Um, the next thing is we calculate distances. We use the Euclidean method. In R. Um, <clears throat> I'm using Michelle's computer here, so there's, there's nothing pre-canned in this. It should work in exactly the same way. Okay, so what do we have here? Keyword, distance. What is D-I-S-T in our language? It's the name of a function. What does the function do? I have no idea. Let's see what dist does. We go to the R window. We say, please help me along. I take you through a number of these R screens. Um, use it as an opportunity to make sure that you're comfortable with the way things are described here. You'll, you'll be needing this at home a lot. And there's a certain you know, template on, on how this is used and, and, and how to understand this. OK. The function computes and returns the distance matrix computed by using the specified distance measure to compute the distances between the rows of a data matrix the rows of a data matrix, because the data is organized, and it has to be organized here in a way where each row represents one element. And the usage is the function called distance, 
What's X? X is the data matrix that you're applying to it. Method, Euclidean. So it simply takes all of the points, all of the values for one point, as if these were coordinates in an n-dimensional space, and calculates the Euclidean distance between these n-dimensional points. You know, if, you, if your data matrix would have just two columns, it would be like the example plot that I've showed you, and you would be like measuring the distances of that plot. Um, okay, and then it describes the arguments a little longer. Um, most of that is, is also uh, default. And there's different kinds of distances that you can apply. Euclidean, Maxim, Manhattan, Canberra, they're defined here. Binary, Minkowski. And as in most cases, there's an example in our code uh, that you can run on data and then play around with it. Okay. So here, all we need is to say, calculate me a distance matrix from the data with the Euclidean method. So what does this look like? This is the entire distance matrix inside. Hmm? Oh, it's still off. Good point. <coughs> so the, the distance values are encoded here. OK. Now, once we have that, we can actually go on and cluster this using the method H cluster for hierarchical clustering. So, sorry, sorry, what are those distances? Distances, this is a distance matrix which defines yeah. all the distances between all the elements according to the Euclidean metric over the 17 dimensional values that we've supplied it. So, this is from point one to point two, point one, point three, point one, point yes. four? Yes, exactly. Is this like the difference? Because this is like gene expression data, right? Yes. So I'm Sam, Sam Mills, Sam yes. Mills and genes, right? Yes. So are you calculating the difference between gene X and gene seven one or two and Yes, exactly. So is this because once we have all the distances, we can then plot them and we can look which points fall closer to each other, i.e. which points are similar. There's no other way to 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 evaluate whether two points are similar than to compare them both. And distance does that comparison and stores the results of the comparison yeah. for the so hierarchy the difference, difference. My distance means the difference in the value between A and right? That's the way this is, this is uh, calculated in this case. But generically, it's a measure of how similar two points in your data set are. Yeah. And after we've, we've clustered them and we're looking at the points, we can, we can of course, then see what this means in practice, how, how similar or different they are. Okay, so with this quick command, we've clustered. Again, H plus is um, the clustering method here. Rocketly clustering the data as you show. Method is single linkage. Uh, initial members is is null, and all the details of that are in the help screen. And oops, ah, oh, this is set up differently. <coughs> And we can plot the hierarchically clustered tree by entering plot HC single. And we get that magical diagram cluster dendrogram, which we've alluded to. Now, maybe it makes a little more sense what we've been talking about. 
So all these leaks in the dendrogram correspond to individual genes in our list, and there's 50. They're just um, encoded by their index. And the clustering algorithm placed closest ones together first, and then recalculated the distance. The closest ones together, then this one happened to be close to this mini cluster here and formed a cluster of three elements, which then happened to be close to this mini cluster of two elements, so they were grouped together, and so on. Things started percolating up from here, and then these two clusters could be joined, and so on, and so on, until everything is clustered together into one large supercluster, which basically contains everything. So how do we, how do we actually get clusters? So basically, as an aside, I have to mention one thing. Um, a dendrogram can be a tricky thing, because you can look at a dendrogram and be completely fooled about the relationships that it represents. And that's because the distances that you're interested in are only distances on the y-axis. The distances on the x-axis are to the largest degree completely arbitrary, at least to very specific degree. And that's because dendrograms are completely identical if you rotate them around these branches here. So if I take this branch here and rotate this entire cluster around this branch, I find that G13 and G15 lie very close together on this dendrogram plot. You're going to have to get a wireless thing for that. Sorry. The first request. Are you serious? Yeah. Everybody else is just, you know, yeah. hiding behind their pulpit and hoping yeah. nobody throws stuff at them? <laughs> well, this is why I brought mine. Um, okay, so if I take this cluster and I rotate around this link here, uh, all of a sudden 13 would move over here and become becomes by very close to 50. If I don't do that, 21 lies very close to 50. Um, but they're identical dendrograms. And this basically tells you, oh, the distance between these things doesn't mean anything at all. The distance is embodied in the path along the dendrogram that you may need to take between two points. And not in where they end up on the paper once they're plotted out. So only things that are connected to each other and looking at the path between two of these leads here will say something about the similarity that's represented in the dendrogram, and not how close they, they can lie here. So if we use this kind of cluster analysis to then start arranging things in, in, in a heat map, in a gene expression plot, there's a second algorithm behind that that chooses things in the best possible way so that uh, similar things lie close together, and then you get these nice red and green bands running through your, your microarray data. But it's not in the initial hierarchical clustering. This is an additional sorting and ordering step. So you, you mentioned that the, the distance is the measure of the path, but without the horizontal lines, just the path with counting only the vertical ones, right? Right. The vertical lines on the path between two points okay. is a measure of the distance. Okay, now, well, how do we get our clusters now from that? So we've completed the procedure clustering, and we see this window here, and we see a dendrogram. What's with the clusters? So if, you know, your PI or you yourself or your wife would ask you, how many clusters are in your data anyway? What would you say? <laughs> yes, or your granting agency. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, that it, it really depends. How many do you want to pull out? Um, the way we pull out clusters here is with the command rectangle 
clusters. And it draws nice little red boxes. And you can specify the parameter k, which is the number of clusters that you would like it to return. So if k equals 2, the algorithm goes through the tree from top to bottom and draws a line through it and stops when the line dissects the dendrogram in a way that you get exactly two clusters. So in this case, you cluster everything into here, and there seems to be a single outlier, G3. It's a single linkage clustering with k equals 2. If k equals 3, the line is drawn a little lower. So you cut here, and you cut here, and you've already cut up here. So you have a cluster that contains g 3, 2, 48, 31, 32, and all the rest in this big cluster. And if you want more, you can get k equals 4. Yes? We'll have a look at that in a moment, because I'm comparing this with different linkage methods to show you what the differences in the clusters are. So again, um, k equals 4, k equals 5, k equals 25, you know, wh whatever you want to have. You can cluster it all the way down until k equals 50, and you get your 50 individual points back. And that, of course, you know, raises the question, well, isn't this all completely arbitrary? How, what, what does it actually tell us that we have a cluster in here? If we can have one large cluster that contains everything or small clusters that contain practically nothing and everything in between. Well, for that, we have to look at the properties of the cluster members. And in order to do that, we need a single R command um, where we classify simply a classification with the command cut tree. So cut tree of our data set, the data object of the Yoraku cluster at k equals 4, um, will then classify our um, data according to the single linkage cluster. And this is what we call it single. And to put all four parts of this classification, um, we give it a parameter that puts two rows and two columns of little plots there. And we can use that plot, matrix plot of the transpose <coughs> of the show data set where the single linkage clustering equals one or two or three or four. Um, X axis label is time, Y axis label is log expression value, and plot that four times in the four different classes. Try that. You should all be able to reproduce that. Just to make sure that you can do this at home. Just to make sure that it is reproducible. good. window have a tendency to be dropping in 
This is our D3, which is somehow an outlier, which doesn't really fit into anything else, which might mean it's um, noise. Might also mean that it is the single master regulator that controls everything else. So if it's noise, we can throw it out. And if it's the single master regulator that controls every, everything else, this one is the most interesting in the whole data set. So only because a cluster is small certainly doesn't mean that it's not interesting. And you didn't get how we extracted the information from the hierarchical clustering or from the matrix that it gets lost in the Okay. That's important. How did we get this information? So those are four questions. <coughs> um, this here. This is the key command. Cut tree. Or Q tree. Cut tree. And it operates on HC single, which is the data structure that the hierarchical clustering has generated. So the parameter, we, we do the hierarchical clustering on the distance matrix we got from the data. We get this data structure. Cut tree operates on that. Um, it operates with a parameter that tells um, cut tree how many clusters I actually want to have as a result. And it puts that also into a data structure, class.single. And I extract <coughs> rows from the data with the conditional statement that class dot symbol for that row should be either one in the first plot, two in the second plot, three in the third plot, or four in the fourth plot. So this is the flow of information there. Well, that's, it's important. If you, if you get lost in the R code, why we do particular things here, uh, it's important for you to ask. It's not going to get more obvious when you go home and just try, try staring at the data. It takes more time. <sighs> okay. So, again, looking at the tree and looking at the clusters that we got from the tree here, this is our cluster number one, the, the one with the greatest number of most similar genes that here, this is cluster number two, which just contains four genes and fallen expression and so on. What you see is that, you know, they're variably similar to each other, um, but they're all linked to the other genes at very high level. So even though they're, you know, more or less similar, if you, if you look at this one here, um, they're among each other very much more similar to every member of the cluster than they are to anything in that other cluster. And this is what the clustering algorithm picks out and calls something from a different category, something from a different class that we can then assign. Okay, as an alternative, we can use complete linked clustering. So we do the same thing, H plus G Joe method is complete this time. And this means we take the furthest members in each cluster and cluster them together and put that into data structure. So, so on the other side, in the back, you pick four clusters based on, you do several analysis of these type of graphs and you pick the, the number of clusters that, that makes them look to you more alike. That's what you do in the rocket cluster. Unless you have prior information that says, you know, I'm clustering data from seven different laboratory animals and I think that they're all different, so let's try clustering of seven and see whether the data from the seven animals actually partition into these clusters or something like that. But if you're just analyzing the data as is and you're looking for underlying structure in your data and you don't have an idea how many clusters there are in the first place, um, you can play around with it. There is, however, a criterion, and we'll get to that later on when we talk about model-based clustering. There's a criterion that you can quantitatively apply <coughs> to ask what is the best choice that you can make. 
it's basically a trade-off between you'd like the clusters to be as large as possible, um, as, as, as defined as possible, but you'd also like them to be um, as few as possible in the data set, simply applying Occam's razor. Occam's razor? Everybody familiar? No? Occam's razor? Never heard of that? Gillette bar. Hmm? <laughs> it was bought by Gillette. <laughs> Occam's razor is a philosophical uh, argument brought forward by William of Occam sometime in the 16th century, I believe. Um, in, in Latin it says, Entia non sunt multiplicanda sine necessitatem, um, which you can translate, of course, it means you should not increase the number of entities without necessity. You should not postulate things if there's not a good reason to postulate them. You should not have more clusters in your data than your data actually wants you to have or forces you to admit there are. The most economical explanation for something is the preferred one. And that wasn't really clear at that time. This was a very new and very revolutionary thought and this is essentially what all of modern science is based on. It's called Occam's razor. It's a razor that cuts through embellishments to theories if the embellishments are not necessary. And a lot of modern statistics actually is based on things like maximum likelihood. And one of the ideas there is that you have to use as little information as possible to go in that you have to, to calculate things. So it's a, it was a very revolutionary thought at that time. Probably as everything revolutionary at that time, it was considered heretical. Um, don't posit angels if there's nothing angelic to be observed. Anyway, that's often the reason. So, so basically, there are ways to come up with as few clusters as possible and make them as distinct as possible. And we'll, we'll look at that in a moment. Okay, back to this here. Um, why do I need the keyword complete here? And I also have it here, and I have in the parameters. The answer is, no, I, I'm, no, don't even think about this deeply. The answer is, that's just the way um, I got, I, I used code here that either was in Peter Dalgard's book or Raphael, I can't remember. Um, they just wrote it that way. It doesn't have to be complete. It could be called fish and chips or something else. Right? We could rec plus on fish and chips k equals 4 if we call this fish and chips. So when you read code, there's again this trade-off here. Sometimes the code, as the dendrogram, suggests relationships that are just spurious. It was called hc complete simply to make sure that it contains the hierarchical clustering of the complete data, but don't be put off. This is just the name of whatever data structure was generated. The only way you need the keyword is actually as the keyword here. Okay. No, no. It could be just any name. It could we could just call it X. Just H C. Yes, just H C. Um, and in fact, there's a certain trade-off here, because if you read your code, you'd like to try to understand what it does. Um, you should always write your code so you put, well, this is just good coding practice, put in comments literally, make sure you don't do you know, anything elegant, because the next person who's going to read it is not going to know how elegant your programming skills are, and he's going to be confused about what you're trying to achieve. Don't use variable names that are too sparse. Um, don't use variable names that suggest things that aren't here. I think this is a poor choice of variable name. I think putting the dot here is a poor choice to begin with because the dot actually can mean um, the separation between a class name and its method or, or something like that. So there's actually a semantic meaning possible with dots. And it becomes complex dependent on, on whether this is used or not. Um, <coughs> So the, the method is different from the other. It's 
complete versus single. Exactly. But it's it's the same thing except that the distance is calculated in a slightly different way. Okay? Oh, as you said, the, the, you know, with the three with the three processes with the different the different types of measurements. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's what that looks like. Um, this is the dendrogram for complete linkage k equals 4. Um, different metric, same data, different clusters. These are the clusters here. Let's look at them. So this was This was the set single linkage which we just looked at. This is the set calculated under complete linkage. So which one do we prefer? You can't really tell, right? So they all have some assets to that that look pretty good. I, I, I like how the steep values are sort of uh, nicely put together here and the more shallow values that have higher baseline. There seems to be no outlier cluster at this, this point here, um, and so on. So, you know, just looking at that, it's probably hard to tell to say which is the better clustering, or is four even a good way to cluster this? Both of them would be correct. Hmm? Both of them would be correct. Yes, and that's an important point. Both of them are essentially correct. Both of them are a different way to look at the data. Both of them are a way to generate hypotheses. Single linkage and complete linkage and average linkage and other metrics that you can apply give you slightly different properties. Now, whether these properties are going to be good or bad for your data set, that depends. Um, you can either say, you know, clustering is just an approximation and we're not going to use it for anything much anyway. So we'll just use the first best method, perhaps single linkage, because everybody uses that and we're going to publish our results and not worry about it. Or you can say, well, we should you know, probably try all the clustering methods and look at the results and get some idea of whether the results we get back make biological sense to us. Because after all, it's a biological question that you're going to ask. For instance, if after clustering your expression data set, you then start coding your genes by gene ontology annotations, and you find that all your gene ontology metabolic pathways fall into this set, whereas all your cell site regulation fall into this set, whereas they're all over the place in this one, there's a strong indication that this gives you a more useful and sensible clustering, which is possibly also more robust than to the unknown genes which might be in your data set to make a good functional prediction. But simply because the algorithm says this is the clustering doesn't mean that it gives you back anything else except a mathematical property of your data set. There's no guarantee that that mathematical property coincides well with the biological properties. Yes? So it should be just quite outside the way to choose between clusters that are choosing the clusters. Is there a good, thing, a good way to choose? Um, there are more sophisticated there are more sophisticated methods and again when we talk about model based clustering briefly we'll come up with one of the methods that allows you to quantify at least the information that your cluster contains but now this is why I was going on at the beginning of understanding your data what I would do in a situation like that is to take great pains to try to simulate data that I would expect to get, genes of different classes, trying to think about how the expression profiles might be differing, um, and then make a simulated data set that has a known number of classes, where you actually know what the correct result is. Then applying your clustering algorithm and finding which of the clustering algorithms 
gives you the known results back in the best possible way. This is the one that I would have the most confidence in to work well on my data set that has unknown properties at the same time. So in my mind, it's really, really important to be able to simulate data and produce synthetic data that you can analyze. It's like, if you don't do that, it's like doing an experiment for which you do not have a positive control. Only under circumstances where the mathematics behind something are so well understood that you can make an argument from first principles why a certain data set should behave in a particular way, then you don't need to have a positive control because the positive control is in the mathematical properties. You just know what's correct. But if you don't know what's correct, then very often in clustering you don't know what the right result is going to be. You really should be simulated. So <clears throat> we could use this kind of information, by the way, to revise the analysis and, and um, select columns within our analysis that seem to be more informative than other columns. Um, because if we, if we look at, at these columns here, you know, they seem to be rather noisy and there's supposed to be a lot of signal in that cluster. So maybe we should be running the cluster analysis just between time points 7, 10, or 12. Under the principle, which is always a sound principle, to try to analyze signal in your data and not noise in your data. The more you can reduce the noise, the more you can filter out things that are actually not relevant from your data before you start doing your clustering and other quantitative analysis, the more distinct your signals are going to be. Okay. K means, oh, five minutes, that's good. Um, K means is, an, is a different clustering method, different from hierarchical clustering. Um, <clears throat> So if we assume k clusters in the data set, um, the goal of k means is to minimize um, the number, the, the distance between cluster elements and the centroids for the cluster um, within clusters relative to between clusters. So basically, um, you take, in, in, in some way, it's similar to hierarchical clustering under um, average linkage, but you iterate it from random starting points until it converges. So you divide the data into k clusters randomly, and you initialize the centroids with the mean of the clusters. So you randomly, and then you just take the mean of a particular cluster and say, that's my cluster centroid, like an average linkage. And then you assign each item to the data set to the cluster with the closest centroid. So after you've calculated these you know, first step centroids, four points somewhere in your data set, you reassign the elements in your data set to new clusters. And the new clusters are simply so that every element is assigned to the cluster that's represented by its closest centroid. The K is something you give it, okay. right? Yeah. So it's not so something the algorithm that. comes up with. If you say arbitrary, it's only arbitrary to the degree that you've given it an arbitrary number. Okay, and once you've gone through um, reassigning all your points, you recalculate the centroids. So the centroids will then shift slightly to re better represent the closest points that you've assigned to them. And then you go over, you do the same thing again. You have new centroids, you forget about the clusters that you've identified before. Um, you reassign all the elements to the closest centroid. Once that is done, you recalculate the centroid. If a lot of elements came from up there, your centroid is going to move slightly up there. So it's going to be slowly drawn towards the regions at least in principle, that are densest around that centroid. So the centroids are going to wander all over until they come up. And once that's done in an optimally possible way, 
so that all objects have been assigned to closed centroids. Um, the clustering converges and the centroids no longer move. So K means is a bit like, for clustering is a bit like cluster for uh, multiple sequence alignment. It's a workhorse that everybody really understands. If you put k-means into your paper as the method that you've clustered on, um, it's relatively unlikely that your referees are going to say they're going to reject the paper because you used a very, very poor clustering methods. We all know there are better clustering methods out there. Still, k-means, like cluster, is the one you use. There's very much better multiple sequence alignment procedures than, than cluster LW, for instance, tea coffee or, or, or other programs like that, much better than cluster L. Still, you know, people still use cluster L because it's something like the state of the art. K-means is a little bit like that. And it's also a little bit the standard that new clustering algorithms are being compared against. So here's an example for K-means. Um, I'm just going to pop this into my R viewer. Where's the window? Okay. So, four K means clustering of a data set. Um, <clears throat> so, I'll go through this briefly before I let you go for lunch. Um, set seed 100, why? What does this do? Forgotten already since yesterday. We'll go over it when you come back from lunch. We'll go over it when you come back from lunch. This is important. In, in some way, this is really important when you start simulating things and recording things in your lab notebook and so on. You can informally use random numbers just to play around with where they're really random and different in any way. But if you use things professionally, um, you'd like them random. Okay, so we calculate um, simply 100 samples from a normal distribution centered on 0, 0 with a standard deviation of 0, 3 and put this into a matrix which has two columns. And so these are 50 points with some randomly distributed um, values. And we do another 100 values with a mean equals one and then standard deviation. And we combine these two to give two clusters which or uh, a data set which sort of you know, snakes along the x, y axis like that. And <clears throat> we do k-means clustering on that data set where the initial points that K means uses are simply random points within the ranges that are used as centroids. And since the points are random, you will notice that every single K means clustering gives slightly different results. And for instance, this blue cluster here is very small. In this cluster here, there's a larger number of these blue points. So, first cluster, then these points would be included in the first cluster, but they would be included in that black cluster over there. So depending on where you start in a k-means clustering, your clustering results may be different. So even though the centroids do not converge anymore, they're actually stuck in some kind of a local minimum. K-means does not compute global best solutions. But it just starts at some point and it moves along from there until it can't go on anymore. But that can be a local minimum regarding the cluster. 
So it's not always robust. And this is one of the, one of the drawbacks of, of k-means, that it's sensitive to initial conditions. And in fact, it's probably wise to recalculate uh, several times with k-means and then ask yourself which of these are actually stable solutions. It's a little bit like doing a phylogenetic tree. You calculate a phylogenetic tree several times over and then ask in a bootstrap analysis which of the bifurcations are actually stable and well supported. Yes? Um, you could, you just have to encode it into a number. Basically, it also uses a distance metric, which is uh, a Euclidean distance on the uh, columns in your vector. So you would just have to change the distance, the distance metric assigned to this, like a different, so you can run it on, uh, on the non-parallel. I, I can't tell you that by heart, um, but the, the, the way this is calculated in k-means is in the help file for R. Look it up, or we can discuss it while everybody's for lunch. Um, but essentially, what it does, it just calculates the distances um, <clears throat> within that space, and um, it basically needs to calculate Euclidean distances between cluster members and centroids, and not all the cluster members among each other. So while the distance matrix calculation is of computational complexity um, and squared, because you have to compare everything with everything, k-means just calculates distances between cluster members and centroids, which is much less than n squared. And you can thus cluster larger data sets. Oh, yes, um, the set seed in the second one basically makes sure that you get, <coughs> when, when you start the first clustering, um, that you actually also have the same initial conditions for the cl first clustering. Because, as I told you, the initial set of centroids is done randomly. And the set seed then initializes the random number generator into a specific state. And it makes its random choices for the first iteration, then random choices for the second, third, and fourth. If I rerun the diagram, they're all going to look slightly different, but they're always going to look identical to the first, second, and third time I run the whole thing. If I would have put set seed into the loop here, um, No, sorry. So you, you have to put the set C even, to, even if you have <coughs> right. your own data, right? This is not yeah, OK. Good. So this works differently than I had remembered it. Um, so apparently, it, set C seems not to influence the choice of the initial parameters here, because you can get different results from run to run. It doesn't affect how uh, the k-means algorithm in, um, calculates its centroids. Otherwise, you would have had to get the same results over and over again. I've run this several times. The, the, the four images always look the same, but there's always the same difference between the four from image to image. So, but if you are using your, the real data, not, uh, meaning not random, randomly generated data, you still have to use those set seats in that part of the code. That's for the yes, I would recommend that because you can then reproduce your results, right? Yeah. <clears throat> what you can do, of course, is to rerun um, with several different values, set seed 100, 101, 102, then you get different results. But each and every single one of them is reproducible if you want to redo your results because you have to reformat your paper for a different journal. 